Yesterday, Rick Satala talked about uh, a future where we might have a majority of our body in new body parts. And I thought, hey, the best that money can buy. <laughs> um, and, and that leads me to our next uh, speaker, because uh, the big new movement in medicine, of course, is to uh, anticipate problems rather than respond to them after the fact. And uh, scanning, uh, tricorders, uh, biotechnology is really uh, the next big wave. And uh, Astro Teller is a guy who is uh, leading that wave. And Teller, I've been meaning to ask you, is it Teller as in the Teller? The Teller from science? The Teller from nuclear that one. subs? Yes, yeah? that's my grandfather. No kidding. A great lineage. Thanks for having me. Astro Teller. So in uh, 1941, the US was just getting into the war, but the war was already pretty developed for the Brits, and the war was going really, really badly for the Royal Air Force in particular. Uh, you know, they were sending out their planes, they had to defend British airspace, they were making sorties across the English Channel to try to fight the Germans on the other side. Um, so there were dogfights in the air, but they were getting strafed mostly from the bottom. And they were losing planes, and obviously the pilots and the gunners, at a completely unsupportable rate. Something had to be done. So the RAF had a, a special section called the ORS, the Operational Research Section, that had been working on this problem for about two years already, uh, pretty much since the beginning of the war. And it was just a really hard problem. I mean, the, the, the thing that you would do, right, is you would just put, like, big armor plating on the bottom of the planes and everything would be okay. But then the planes are so heavy that they can't get anything done, right? So there's no point sending them out. So you could put a little bit of armor plating there, but not a ton, uh, literally. Uh, and, and where to put it was really non-obvious, because you had to defend the pilot, obviously, the gunners, it would be nice. A certain, the munitions, you hit those and things go bad. The fuel, the fuselage, the engines, et cetera. The steering mechanisms. So where do you put what little bits of armor plating you can put on the bottom of the plane? So they, they kind of written it off as an unsolvably complex problem. But that was not gonna work since they were actually asking these guys to go out and fly these planes and, and have these dogfights. Uh, so in a fit of desperation, they invited a, a mathematician from a local university to come look at the planes. And this guy showed up, you know, tweed jacket, fuzzy hair, and uh, he didn't talk to anybody. He just disappeared under one of the planes almost immediately. And, you know, so they just wrote him off. I think they completely forgot about him. So a week later, he shows up. I think everyone was just surprised that he was still on the base at all. <laughs> and, and he apologized for having taken a week to come up with their solution. And he said, well, so here it is. And he spread out this big piece of cray paper. And they said, you're an academic. You know, he was this really roughly drawn silhouette at the bottom of the plane. And there were these funny amoeba shapes on it. And he said, well, that's where you should put the armor plating. And they said, you're a kook, but <laughs> uh, we'll humor you. Why do you think that's where we, you should put the little bit of armor plating we can afford? And he said, well, that's where there were no bullet holes. And I said, oh, you're not an academic. You're a lunatic. <laughs> We're going to take this tiny amount of armor plating that we can afford and put it on the places that the planes don't get hit? Go away. And he said, well, it's a little complicated. Just think about it for a second. We, we can't look at the planes that we really care about. They're in the bottom of the English Channel. These planes have one thing in common. None of these planes were hit in these places. And that turned out to be the insight that the RAF needed, and it worked better than they could have hoped for. There are two things that make me leap out of bed in the morning. One of them is that story. I really believe that an increasing number of very hard, very important problems will be solved by looking away from, I don't just mean engineering problems, will be solved by looking away from where the bullet holes are and focusing and thinking more deeply about where the bullet holes aren't. So um, I will uh, give you what I believe is sort of the next big one, uh, near and dear to my heart. 
and it's unobtrusive wearable body monitoring. The, so that's the invention. The information that comes along with that is an all the time in detail view of what's going on with the human body. Not in the hospital, here, all the time, in your natural environments. Two thirds of healthcare costs come from the choices that we make on behalf of our bodies, but we have no idea what's going on with our own bodies. We have no clue, we have no feedback, we have no basis for changing our behavior or for sticking with something if it's working. When, we, when my company started to work on this thing five years ago, we, I don't know a nice way to say this, we were just, we were laughed out of all the offices we went into, basically. They said, you can't make something that's accurate and comprehensive, but that would also fade into the background of my life like my wedding ring does, that I would just sort of wear all the time, and of course it's gonna have to be cheap enough that we could all have them. When the mathematician showed up, on that airbase, he didn't get all wound up about the fact that there were smart airplane people there, the aeronautics experts and the munitions experts and the armor plating guys, whatever they're called. It's not that he disrespected them, it's that he over-respected them. He completely respected them. He said, if you guys can't figure it out, I certainly won't be able to figure it out that way. So he took everything they were trying to study and he put it over here in a black box and he said, if this problem can be solved, it can be solved without looking in that black box because the experts can't figure it out. It's a pretty radical thing to do, but it wasn't because he didn't think they were smart. He just acknowledged they were way smarter than he was on that particular issue. We've done exactly the same thing with getting information about the human body. There was no way that we were going to be smarter than the last hundred years of human physiology experts and biomedical experts. What if we said we didn't care how the human body worked? What if we said that we were gonna study the data, we were gonna model the data instead of modeling the system? And it turns out, five years later, after we started the company, that it works. It works better than we could have hoped for. Um, and in fact, the people who you might think would be our biggest critics, the human physiology experts, are actually now some of our biggest proponents writing papers and, and publishing them because they're the people who are most desperate to have some quantitative tools to study you people, all of us, out in the real world. So they're actually very excited about this. So I promised you an example. Um, my company actually makes a number of different things, but this is an example of what it looks like. This has a computer, a processor, um, memory, sensors, um, and it's just watching my body many times a second and making or using statistical algorithms that have been built out of a lot of this data. So imagine that Zacharias Janssen in 1595 runs out of his house with the world's first compound microscope like Archimedes you know, yelling Eureka down the street in his uh, birthday suit. And, and he's like, yeah, you know, for the first time, we can actually see really, really small things. We can see things so small we've never seen them before, the, the building blocks of the world. And he was probably overstating the case a little bit since it was like a factor nine magnification, but, <laughs> but no worse than I just did about ours. So he made the microscope, and that was good. I mean, that's not a bad thing, but that's just the invention. It opens the doors to the possibilities. It isn't, uh, you know, uh, medicine, chemistry, biology, they all exploded as a direct result of that invention. But the microscope isn't medicine. It just made a lot of medicine possible. Whenever somebody says to me that something is impossible, this is the first sentence that goes through my mind. And, and maybe it can be for some of you too. Go look where the bullets aren't. <laughs>